No. <gasps> no, you're kidding me. What did she say next? Sorry, mom, actually, I have to go. I have guests. Yes, I have friends. Okay, I love you too. All right, bye. Hi friends, I hope you're having a magical day today. For those of you who are new, hello. My name is Forrest. I am a children's book illustrator and aspiring author. And today I'm going to be answering some questions about uh, what it's like being a freelancer, working in the kids book field and my creative process kind of stuff. The other day I posted on my Instagram if anybody had any questions and a lot of you responded, which is really nice. So thank you. And we're just going to go over that and hopefully this will be uh, insightful and helpful and entertaining in some way. This is going to be a cozy little rambly talky artsy video that you could have like on in the background while you're painting or maybe just relaxing but uh we're just gonna get straight into it so first question how do you deal with the instability of the kid lit field Oof. um great question that is something that's been on my mind a lot recently um publishing has been dealing with a lot the last couple of years. Um, I think everything kind of changed in 2020. I know, for example, so I'm working on three books right now. I'm working on two middle grade books and one picture book. And um, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't gotten paid since February. And I should have been given at least a few of my installments for payments by now. Um, my agent actually emailed me the other day and was like, what's the status of the deliverables that you've given to them? Because I feel like you should have gotten paid by now. I'm really bad at advocating for myself. <laughs> so without my agent, I'd just be floundering. I would just be like, it's okay. It's fine. I don't need money. But Part of the reason why that is, I think, um, is that there's a lot of changes that are happening. I know there are a lot of acquisitions being done. There are imprints that are merging, and I think that that's causing things to be delayed. One of my the middle grade books I'm working on was supposed to come out later this year, and the release date was then pushed to uh, next year, which has then delayed everything else. And because of that, um, I will be honest, I think this is my last year of doing this in a full-time capacity. I can't be in another position like this again. And I'm not trying to say this to be discouraging. My goal is to always be realistic. I am lucky that I've saved up enough money where I will be okay. I would like to get my money. <laughs> um, and I will, my agent is on that. And so I think that I am going to be pulling back from doing this full time and instead going back to working a regular job again and maybe taking on only one or two books a year instead of like four. And also trying to be cognizant that like, you know, my family's getting older. I want to be able to be in a position where I could take care of them when the time comes. And so that's just had me rethink a lot of the things that I want to do with my life. I will never stop working in children's books. I love illustrating children's books. This is what I've wanted to do since I was a kid. And I'm so glad that I've been able to do it. But I'm just going to reframe and restructure how I continue moving forward. So next question, biggest inspiration right now or of all time? Golly, that is so hard to answer. I am constantly finding new artists and illustrators that I am inspired by. I I can't just give like one. I'm just gonna throw a bunch of, of names out there of people who have inspired me and I hope that that's okay. So growing up, the artists that I can remember who inspired me the most were Tony D. Terlizzi, who did the Spiderwick Chronicles and Brett Helquist, who did a series of unfortunate events and Edward Gorey, who's done like a ton of wonderfully dark kids books. Other book illustrators who I love and have inspired me are um, Rebecca Green, Christian Robinson, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but Felicita Sala, Julia Sarda, Jenin Mohammed, Zach Manbeck, and um, Matthew Forsyth. All of them have fantastic work and have inspired me in a variety of ways. I, every single artist who I mention, I adore their work very, very much. Also, when I was discovering my style, um, I looked at a lot of mid-century artists and one in particular who really, really inspired me, his name is Aurelius Battaglia, which is a fantastic name. Oh, Mary Blair, Mary Blair, Mary Blair. How could I forget Mary Blair? Another one, mid-century artist, love, obsessed with her work, colorful, great shapes, great texture. Everything just feels like it's 
coming alive off the page. But there are a lot of artists on here who I love, um, like, you know, Lee Ellickson, Cheyenne Barton. There is uh, Tiffany, whose username is Apple Cheeks on YouTube. There's also uh, Kristen, who goes by Little Tiny Egg on YouTube. There's also someone I recently discovered who I'm really enjoying a lot. Um, their username is Fructus Illustrations, but the artist's name is Jen, and her work is also very, very cute, very, very whimsical and colorful and bright. I definitely recommend checking out her YouTube and her work. And the last artist I will mention, but definitely not the least, is uh, Sophie McPike, who I am obsessed with. Her artwork, her use of color, her shapes. I'm, I, she has inspired me to work in gouache and colored pencil again after me, I was working uh, digitally almost exclusively for years. Her work is just delicious. It's like it's like a snack. I just want to I just want to eat it. I just want to eat it. It's so pretty. I love her stuff and her YouTube videos. It's like I'm being enveloped by a warm blanket with a cup of tea. I don't have enough nice things to say about her or any of the artists that I've mentioned. Okay, I think that's all. I think I got them all. Next question. How do you find work? If it were not for my agent, I would not be getting the work that I have. And having an agent in this field, I don't want to say is necessary, but it is pretty darn helpful. An agent can help you get an art director's attention, whether it's by doing promotional materials or going to events where industry people are. Overall, an agent is what has helped me get the work that I've been able to do. Next question, favorite art material? I'm gonna say colored pencils. Actually, I'll just say pencils because I also love graphite pencils, but yeah, there's just something about like you can, they're so versatile, you can get like really, really soft texture or you can go with like bold lines, color, and just blend the crap out of something. Next one is, is it fun or easy to do? Do people often complain about your drawings? Um, is it fun? Yes. Is it easy? No. I think that it definitely depends on the deadline that you're given. At the end of the day, it's still a job. So is it always fun? No. Is it always easy? No but it's something that I care about a lot and I love doing this work and so that definitely helps to keep me motivated in order to keep going. Now with regards to your second question, um, do people complain about my drawings? No, obviously art directors and editors will always have notes for you during this process. You know, you don't just make sketches and then go to final art and everything is done. There's a back and forth. So that's fine. I will say I can't be specific because I don't want to um, get in trouble, but there was a situation with one of the books I've worked on where an author had feedback that was, um, the way he phrased things was very interesting to the point that my agent emailed me privately and was like, I don't know how you feel, but I'm pissed the fuck off. Um, which made me feel good because, because um, yeah, it wasn't great. I will be honest, it really wasn't great and it really hurt my feelings. It was just unnecessary. Like there's a difference between giving constructive criticism and then just tearing something apart just because you can. That was hard. I didn't love that honestly, but that's the only time that that has happened. Everything else, any other area of critique I get, I mean, yeah, sometimes it'll be frustrating because, you know, I'm a Capricorn. I think I know best. I always understand when things need to be changed, but it was just that one time that I was like, okay, and I hope that that doesn't happen again. Anyway, how much money are you making and from what revenue streams exactly? So I just work on children's books. I did at one point have an online shop, but um, I shut it down because i mean one i didn't advertise it but also i never sold any prints <laughs> i never sold any prints so i just didn't feel motivated to keep it running maybe in the future i will if people are interested in buying any prints but right now i just work on children's books when i was working a full-time job i only worked on a couple of books a year so at that time i was maybe making like just over 20 grand per year but this year i will be making about almost 60 i think so for my the books i'm working on when am i actually going to get that money who knows? But yeah, that's my only income stream. I know other artists and art content creators take sponsorships and maybe that's something that I would do if I had like a big enough following here on 
Instagram. But even then, honestly, I, I hesitate to say that because I would only ever agree to sponsorships for things that I actually use like Squarespace, which is what I use for my website, Epidemic Sound, which is like where I get my music and stuff, Notion, or things that I would use like Skillshare and other things I can't think of. But, but I don't want to just be someone that just like peddles crap to people, especially if it's not something that I'm genuinely connected to. I mean, I get that people have to make money and I'm not saying that people who do sponsorships are bad. That's not at all what I'm saying. I just, it wouldn't feel authentic to me just to take on anything. And I also just don't want to be someone that just like sells people crap i value people who watch my videos i value people who actually spend time to be here and i want to make sure that i'm providing actual content and anything that i would be selling or any partnership that i would be taking on i would feel a responsibility to make sure that it's actually something that i vet that i use or would use and consider to be something worthwhile to share that was a long rambly way to answer the question but i hope that that did answer it next question what do you work on in down periods when there is no client work so something that i've worked on is my own books. I'm currently writing a horror fantasy middle grade book that I'm really really excited about. I sent some chapters to my agent and she really likes it. It's kind of like Mean Girls and Grimm's Fairy Tales had a baby. So that's something that I've been working on. I think that that's what my focus is going to be moving forward is that I would like to really take on my own books and bring those out into the world. Not that I haven't enjoyed illustrating other people's books. I definitely would like to have my own book. Please please next question do you always save up salary as a freelancer for a rainy day um i have yes which is how i've been able to keep myself afloat while i am waiting to get my money but i do think that in this field as i mentioned it is a little bit unstable i've tried to be as intelligent about saving my money as possible so i do recommend doing that because um as you can see it can get dicey <laughs> next one is what was your favorite project to work on and why this is such a cheap answer because honestly the picture book i'm working on right now is probably my favorite book that i'm working on but i can't really talk about that because um it's not come out yet if you watch my previous video you'll see some of the characters that i've illustrated for it but instead i will talk about a book that i can actually mention so the first book is the big day by rachel Plummer. this is published in the uk um, but it's a really, really beautiful story. Uh, it's a rhyming book about this boy who gets invited to this wedding um, in the sky of these giants. It's just a really, really sweet story that shows that love is love no matter what size and shape it takes. And I'm always glad to, as a queer person, to be able to work on a story that reflects my experiences and experiences of actual people and families around the world. And we should stop banning books. <laughs> I'm fine. Totally not stressing about this presidential election at all. Another book that I was really excited to work on is Kitty Farrell and the Case of the Marshmallow Monkey. This was a lot of fun. This is a project that was um, in collaboration with Turner Classic Movies, which I grew up on as a kid. I was over my my grandparents house all the time when I was growing up and we would always watch like Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Bergman, Katherine Hepburn, Grace Kelly. This is it's like a kid noir style book and I did it almost entirely in graphite pencil and colored pencil and I love how it turned out. This was just such a delight to be able to bring to life. Next question. Hi, do you plan to open a Patreon account to share your process of child book making? Actually, I have been thinking about that. There is a part of me that's just been hesitant about it because I'm like, there are a ton of other artists out there who have bigger followings and have more experience or whatever than I do. Why would anybody want to support a Patreon for little old me? But that is something that I've thought about, just having like maybe an in-depth newsletter or a podcast or something that talks about my process or things that help motivate me to create behind the scenes of like stuff that I'm working on or things about the industry, like questions and answers stuff that we can talk about. So that is something that I have been thinking about. And if anyone is interested, please let me know in the comments. Um, I would love to hear if that's something that people would consider. Next one is, when do you feel like you nailed your style and knew what your niche slash expertise was? I'm actually going to make a separate video about finding your style because I have a lot of thoughts about it. I think it's important to have a visual voice, but I also think that your voice is also innately yours and will come out on its own. And I also feel like the idea you just have to have one style that has to be your own thing forever is ludicrous. I don't feel like my style has always been the same. I enjoy the way that I work now, 
but things have definitely changed. Like a couple of years ago, I was working this way and now my work looks like this. But I always knew that children's books was my niche and that was always just something that I wanted to do. Books as a kid were a lifeline and a safety net for me and I think that's why I was always drawn to them. And I love whimsy and magic and there were just so many things about the books that I would read as a kid that just really inspired me. So I think that that's always been a part of me and my identity and how I have grown and shaped myself as the artist that I am today. Next is, has AI affected you in any way? Emotionally? Yes. Other than that, no. I mean, I, I've still been able to get work and I think that publishing, at least right now, for the most part is okay. Although I was really annoyed when Christopher Paolini's book came out with an AI generated cover. That upset me a lot, I'm not gonna lie. But for the most part, from what I've heard from my agent slash art directors in the field is that right now, publishers and art directors and editors aren't interested in working with artists and selling books by people who use AI generated content. I also won't lie and say that this whole AI thing is also another reason why I'm looking to reframe my career moving forward. Don't love it, it makes me sad, and I want to scream. Next is, what do you like more, illustrations or cover design? For picture books, I'm gonna say illustrations, and middle grade, I'm gonna say covers. Next question. Do you have a mental checklist that you tick off when creating an illustration? Um, honestly, no. I am really bad. There are people out there who are so regimented and organized and plan and know exactly what they're gonna do at every step of the process. Not me. <laughs> Not me. I don't, I, I will always do a sketch. I will always sketch out what the composition will be. But in terms of colors and stuff, I kind of feel it as I go, at least in my personal work. In my book work, I'll do sketches for the interior illustrations and then once those are approved, I'll put them all in a document and then I will figure out the color story and make sure that everything looks cohesive throughout the whole narrative. And that way I kind of already blocked things in so that I don't have to do any guesswork when it comes to going into finals. When it comes to my own work, all bets are off. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what materials I'm using. I am just, you know, going with the vibe. <laughs> Next is, how do you resp oh, <laughs> how do you respond to, oh, you're an illustrator? I have a book idea for you. I try really hard to remember and remind myself that this person ideally is coming at you with good intentions. So I try to be as polite as I possibly can with my response. So what I usually say is, that's really, really awesome. I always encourage people to write and create stories Right now, I'm just a little busy with client work, so I'm, I can't take on anything at the moment. And that usually works. And if they're insistent, I'll just say that like, you know, my schedule is booked out for like the next year and that will shut them down. This, oh, this person says, I just love to see you paint. That's really cute, thank you. Uh, next question, how do you deal with creative blocks? I also was going to make a separate video about this, but a little that I will say right now is I have learned that my creative blocks usually come from some kind of source, whether it's guilt, fear, shame. I think that you can always trace the creative block back to something, at least in my experience. So I try to do a lot of introspection to figure out what that source is and then address it from there. Now for the last one of the day, any tips on how to emotionally manage the agent hunt phase? I get that. Hunting for an agent really, really sucks. But I've seen your work and you are talented and I'm sorry that this has been a shitty process. When I was first looking for agents, it took me a pretty long time to find somebody. I think it took me like a almost a year. I think the best thing when it comes to something like this, when you're doing something that you're not getting a return on, but you really, really want is to just remind yourself, why am I pursuing this? And hopefully use that impetus to keep pushing you forward through the dark times. I hope you don't give up. I will emphasize that this is a really, really hard thing to do and a hard business to be in. Just keep working on your work keep working on your skills, keep working on your portfolio, and don't give up. But also take a break if you feel like it. I don't ever want anyone to give up on their dreams, but I firmly believe that mental health comes first. Anyway, 
That was a bit rambly, but I hope that there were nuggets of helpful advice in there somewhere. All right, that was it. Thank you everybody for asking the questions. I wasn't expecting people to actually answer, so this is really, really great. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate you guys, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye for now.